Change is one of the most provocative words in the English language. Here in America, the obsession has always been technology. We've always had our eye on the prize, the future. As a young society, we look forward, we glorify the change makers of tomorrow. That's why you are all here today, as we explore the magnificent power of change. Some of you are innovators, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, all about that sexy word, change. So we know why you're here, but why am I here? How dare I stand before you wearing some traditional costume of an ancient civilization you've never even heard of, and technically, supposedly, we never even existed. Think of me as a long lost ghost that came to present the opposite voice, the alter ego of change, the power of not changing. But before I dive into the past, I'd like to ask if you are wearing pants, please rise. That means you're welcome and Circassian. I say that because the pants originated in my ancestral homeland of the Euro-Asian steppes. Now please make yourself comfortable because I'm about to take you on a ride around the world a few thousand years back so you can see how this ancient civilization contributed to the world in the most survivalistic of ways. How? By refusing to change and by standing strong against the world. We change the world and history as you know it. Geographically, the Caucasus is the exact center point between Europe, Russia, Asia, and the Middle East. We have the highest mountain in all of Europe. Mount Elbrus. I bet you've never even heard of that, right? Well, our land is filled with treasures that have been kept secret for thousands of years. It was our mountains that was our only friends, protectors, and strategic partners against invasion after invasion. They gave us rich minerals, such as bronze and copper, which preempted the Bronze Age with the best daggers and swords. The foothills and lower grassy regions allowed for grazing of cattle, bison, sheep, and horses. Today, historians are pretty much in agreement that the first domestication of horses was right there in those Euro-Asian steppes. These ancient civilizations are referred to as the Scythians Sarmatians, which means free men. They were nomadic horsemen. This was the Proto-Indo-European era. My people are considered original inhabitants of this land. And until today, we Circassians have an obsessive relationship with our magnificent horses and raising children to be the bravest of warriors. Our dances and fancy footwork imitate the fast prancing passion and our bravado while throwing daggers around for fun. Our women play both parts equally well, from our graceful gliding feminine motions to being fierce competitors in the battlefield, defending our land. Do you wanna know what our secret was? Even the ancient Greeks didn't realize what it was that made us savage warriors, as they said, the object of their fascinations. They wrote us into their mythology and artwork. Even now, Hollywood has banked on the legends of the Amazons. So here's the secret. When you take a three-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy and put them on a horse and teach them the technical skills of archery, swordsmanship, and swift dagger control at early ages, there is no difference between the physical strength of a man or a woman. Horses were the great equalizer. So our women had equal opportunity to fight and defend our land with the same honor and distinction as our men. We earned our rights of equality. But when the ancient Greeks saw this for the first time, they were yeah, mesmerized, intrigued, but intimidated, especially because they did not want their own women to see these ludicrous creatures do what no woman should be doing. Until today, one of the most common Circassian names for girls is Maza, which means moon. 
or Meza, which means Lady of the Forest. And that is how the mythological legends of the Amazons came to be. So while we were totally okay with an egalitarian society, democratically deciding war strategies around a fire pit, that just didn't sit well with the Greeks. So of course they sent their Spartan heroes to take us down and strip us of our gilded belts, just like the Wonder Woman series. They also spread crazy stories about us being savage, man-hating, backwards creatures that wore gilded belts like this. And yes, pants. Yes, that is actually in the ancient Greek literature, starting with Herodotus. They mocked us wearing pants, those savage creatures that wore pants, but we did not change. Now remember, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, and the far Western Europeans were still wearing togas, robes, long gowns, all the way, and even kilts, long before the biblical times, through the Middle Ages. So here we were, the nomadic warriors that lived on horses. And of course, what happens when you ride on a horse all day and all night? Chafing. <laughs> So it's perfectly safe to say those cute little black yoga pants that you love, those were a thing long ago before you fashionistas had them. Again, chouet blanc. So wait, how did all this information get buried for so long? And why all of a sudden are we hearing about this Indo-European civilization out of nowhere? Thanks to a handful of amazing scholars that dedicated their entire careers to studying these ancient civilizations, from linguists to archaeologists, they independently did their own thing. And then randomly, it all came together just in the last 10 years, thanks to more advanced DNA technology. So it all starts with an anthropologist, Dr. Adrienne Mayer from Stanford University. She was at the New York Museum of Metropolitan Art, studying some of these ancient Greek vases that have baffled historians for over 2,500 years. They practically gave up when Dr. Mayer said, let's try one more thing. There's this Harvard-trained linguist that knows 17 languages, primarily from that region over there. Greece is over here, the Black Sea, and then the Caucasus. Maybe he can help us identify this gibberish language. So she called Dr. John Colarusso and asked him to take a look and see if he came across anything remotely recognizable. But she does not send him the actual image on the vase, so he cannot interpret the image. Well, Dr. Colarusso immediately responds with, oh, that's easy, that's Circassian. And it says, the old man stole the goose from the woman and the loyal dog is at her feet. And in that moment, Dr. Mayer tells him he just solved the goose face mystery. Other images and portrayals of Amazons now directly link the correlation of Greek mythology with actual evidence of real Amazons speaking my ancient language of Circassian. Meanwhile, Dr. Colarusso also filled in the blanks of a thousand other mysteries. He has spent a lifetime translating our ancient oral poetry known as the Nart Sagas. These include our detailed social code of honor called Adiha Khabza, which we Circassians still follow in the most obsessively strict ways today. This taught us how to raise our children to be disciplined warriors, how to tame wild horses, and how to respect our elders in the most honorable of ways. Okay, so now let's go back to UCLA. Two historians, Dr. C. Scott Littleton and Dr. Linda Malcor. They made credible arguments tracing the ancient traditions of Camelot, King Arthur, Sir Lancelot, and the sword in the stone. All that mythology right back from our ancient Narc sagas. The same ancient oral traditions that have not changed one word going back thousands of Meanwhile, but wait, there's more. <laughs> for the first time in history, Russia granted permission for an American archaeologist, Dr. Janine Kimball Davis, to team up with a group of Russian archaeologists to dig up over 1,000 burial sites that reveal women warriors. 
buried with their weapons, with their horses. <laughs> and yes, you guessed it, traces of fabric as pants. Our ancient fashionista warriors wore pants. Here's a pic of a burial site with her position in a horse riding position, as if to signify she is a warrior princess worthy of riding into the afterlife on her gallant horse. To these scholars, we Circassians owe a great debt of gratitude for bringing us back to life and resuscitating our long lost culture from non-existence. In fact, one of the Nart sagas is about a curse we inflicted upon ourselves. When the gods asked us, if you would rather be an unknown nation with long stable lives, or that with short lives, but that great courage and valor to be known forever, we chose, let our fame be great. An investigative journalist, Oliver Below, wrote the most truly haunting portrayal of our existence. He went back in time to the largest and first genocide on European soil in modern history that killed approximately one million of my ancestors. After we fought off the Russians for over 100 years, but finally on May 21st, 1864, we said goodbye to our beloved mountains in a forced exile from our homeland. Only about 500,000 remained, but even those that remained suffered another ethnic cleansing cycle in the 1940s with Stalin trying to finish us off and then deleting our names, maps, and any evidence of our claim to the land, any books, encyclopedias. We didn't exist. We were invisible. My grandfather, Dr. Muhammad Ali Bshahalouk, was one of the survivors on the very few boats that did not drown in the Black Sea while seeking refuge in Europe and in any of the Middle Eastern countries. My family landed in Syria. At some point, each country wants its ethnic minorities to quickly assimilate and not gain too much prominence. There is a melting pot, not just in America. There's a pattern in human nature to want a stable, more homogenous population and a rejection of any new kid on the block. So the government of Syria assigned more Arabic or Islamic sounding names to the Circassians so they can, you know, more easily blend in. But my father filed a lawsuit against the government of Syria to retain his name because he was the last male descendant of a noble Shahaluk lineage from the Bjadduk tribe. He was granted that. The problem is the name is actually pronounced Pshahaluk. But because there is no P in Arabic, we ended up with a B. <laughs> So by the time we arrived in America in 1971, we could not change our papers. So that's how we ended up with the most impossible sounding name. Go ahead, I dare you. Yes. Bitchaholic, it's okay, I've heard it all before. That's why when I was growing up, I told everyone my name was Cindy. I just wanted to be like Cindy Brady from the Brady Bunch because she had a lisp and I had a lisp, stuttering, and of course, extreme shyness, because I couldn't figure out how to fit in. And here, you can see me on a hot August day in 1974. My father, who was so in love with America and wanting to prove to everyone we can balance our past with our future in this land of opportunity, and yet not forsake our beautiful heritage. He insisted I wear my Circassian fascia and stand there in front of everybody passing by. He kept saying, raise your hand on your heart and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I was mortified. You can see I'm barely lifting my hand. Years later, what does my father do? When we finally become citizens, he changes our name. You're probably thinking, sure, he Americanized it, right? No. He went to fix the spelling from bitchaholic to pshahaluk, as if that makes it any better. No, seriously, can you blame me that when I became an adult, I said enough is enough, and hence my name is Suhan Beck. Done. I was in. 
Now I was free to become the innovative entrepreneur that I am without all the cultural baggage of what kind of name is that? Ain't nobody got time for that. Until the day when suddenly now the whole world was fascinated with my people, my culture, my Circassian heritage. We've been invisible all these years. And now all the academic scholars are racing to study us. Universities are popping up in Germany with Caucasus studies. The first film festival will be in 2020 for Circassian films. And now get this, there are these two regular American guys that go to my homeland and set up a tourism company, smack dab in the middle. And they advertise by hosting this podcast called Caucus Talk. These regular American guys are completely mesmerized by, by what? <laughs> by us. It's amazing because I've always felt invisible and now all of a sudden I'm not invisible anymore. And I've suddenly become obsessed with catching up to all of these scholars and relearning my very difficult Circassian language. I'm tracing back my family tree and filling in all the blanks. What we've realized that by not changing our ways, despite how much we've been through, genocides, exile, our power was in not changing. We stayed true to our way of life and our ideals. That is what is now fascinating the outside world. For the most part, I can say the Circassians all over the world, we are about eight to 10 million. We assimilated perfectly fine in all of our host countries. In fact, we served in the military. In all of our new borrowed homelands from Europe, America, and Middle East, we did not get lost in the melting pot. Despite its overwhelming power to change all of us, it certainly has its own centrifugal gravitational force that can sweep you in and make you dizzy and not let go until you no longer recognize yourself because you have melted away. You've surrendered every little quirky, charming thing of your history that made you different, just like I did when I wanted to be just like Cindy Brady. For every one of you here today, I, Sue Han Beck, AKA Shahaluk, I challenge you to dig and reflect deeper what do you individually bring to the table? Maybe, just maybe, you can skip the melting pot and just show up at the potluck with your distinctive recipe. What ancient tradition or language or way of thinking can you keep that would give you an added advantage, depth, and separate you from the masses? What if deep in your cupboards, down below your bathroom sink, there's a container of some ancient herbal medicinal formula that your grandfather created? What if that goopy, oily concoction that you rejected while growing up was actually a solution to so many people's skin problems? Well, that was me. And yes, my Circassian grandfather was a surgeon, created something that only 10 years ago I launched and is now a global brand that is exported around the world every day. And because I resuscitated something from our family's heritage, that would have completely been erased. Now I have found a way to honor all of my ancestors. I put my grandfather's picture and his full Circassian name on every jar. I did it. I finally have found my balance between the past and the future, between change and not changing. I can say the Pledge of Allegiance while wearing my Circassian fascia. There is no contradiction in doing so. I hope that I've taken you on a journey back thousands of years to be a fierce Circassian warrior. Maybe you felt a kindred spirit with our long lost Amazonian women that survived a few genocides, some ethnic cleansing, a final exile, and purposely being deleted out of the history books. I hope you enjoyed climbing our sacred and majestic Mount Elbrus to see all of Europe and Asia around you. Down the foothills, we ride on the wild horses. And now I'm bringing you back to the warm safety of your home, your bedroom. And as you put your pants on each morning, 
slip your right leg in. Think about how you will change the world that day. Then slip your other leg in and remember what you must not change about yourself. What will you preserve? Trust that somewhere far beyond yourself today, there is untapped greatness in your history. Then as you stand up and find your balance between your magnificent past and your limitless future, power up self.